Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to uh, Left Side of the Aisle. And uh, I'm your host, as always. My name is Larry Erickson, as always. And as always, for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you with things that uh, I think are important and I think are worthy of your attention. Uh, Again, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, email them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there, or if you'd rather, you can leave a comment there. Uh, and uh, again, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle or your cable, something so that it's obviously not spam. And um, be a little patient. I'm a little slow about answering my email. I, I do answer it. You will get an answer. But, um, well, I'm not the quickest about it. Anyway, with all the traditional nonsense out of the way, we'll get to it. And I'm going to start, well, I... I I like to start every week where I can with good news. Um, this week I don't really have good news, but it's like not entirely bad news. Um, it has uh, it has something to do with something I haven't talked about in a while. Guns. Now, you know, I know you know about the killing rampage in Isla Vista, California last week. A man identified as 22-year-old Elliot Roger shot and killed three people, stabbed to death three more, and injured another 13, some by gunfire, before he killed himself. Now, it's clear that Roger was an actual example of the the disturbed young man who's almost become a media cliche in, uh, in covering mass shootings or mass killings. The tragedy of his life became the tragedy of a number of other people's lives, including not only the dead and the wounded, but those who were left behind to mourn. One of those feeling, uh, people who was left behind made his feelings in the matter quite clear. In a press conference the day after the shooting, Richard Martinez, he was the father of 22-year-old Christopher Martinez, who was among those shot and killed, blamed, quoting, craven, irresponsible politicians and the NRA for his son's death. He ended a statement by saying, and I'm quoting him here, when will this insanity stop? When will enough people say, stop this madness? Too many have died. We should say to ourselves, not one more. Now, I can't give that the, the true emotion with which he expressed it. You really should see this if you have not. If you, if you haven't seen it, there will be a link to the news conference at my website. Um, you really should see it. But the, the question now, though, is, you know, what good can possibly come out of a situation like that? What, what new, good news could come out of that? Well, the good news or at least the not completely bad news, I again should say, is that a few people, a few places, are again actually daring to utter the words, gun control. For example, Representative, U.S. Representative Peter King, who is in many ways a total loss as a human being, is at least a longtime advocate for stronger gun controls. And he said the shootings re-raise the issue for the need of expanded and tightened background checks on gun purchases. Um, and considering that Roger had three semi-automatic handguns and 40 fully rounded, uh, f uh, sorry, fully loaded magazines of ammunition in his car, uh, all of which he got legally, eh, the question would seem to be a given, but on this issue, unhappily, it never is. King, by the way, was not the only member of Congress to raise uh, gun control. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut did likewise. Now, the thing is, there is, li li well, no, make that no chance, that the murders in Isla Vista will move the national debate. Uh, Martina's use of the word craven was well chosen. Cowardly is another alternative. Um, and there was a problem with a greater focus on mental health resources, such as Blumenfield and others that propose as a way to move the issue forward. There is no reliable evidence that people with mental illness are any more likely to commit violent crimes than so-called normal people like the rest of us. I mean, 
yeah, we hear about the Elliot Rogers. We hear about the Sung He Cho's. While we forget that on any average day in this country, 86 people die from guns, including 32 murders and 51 suicides, almost all of which were done by normal people. But despite that, despite that unhappy truth, we can at least take heart in the fact that what this means is that not everyone has given up. Uh, some people, at least, can still raise a candle in the rain, if you will, and that some people can still look to a time when maybe someday when NRA President uh, Wayne La Pipi Le Pew is up there screeching, they're coming for your guns, that it might actually be true. And what's more, there are actually some people in a position to actually do something. For example, on May 27th, the Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, his name is Robert DeLeo, he proposed uh, the most comprehensive change and improvement in Massachusetts gun laws in 16 years, saying that the state cannot wait for the feds to act. Under the bill, local police would, given, would be given expanded discretion rather, to consider a person's suitability for owning a gun. And the state would join a national database for criminal and mental health background checks, and all private sales of firearms would have to take place in the presence of a registered dealer. Now, DeLeo said that he hoped the bill, which was originally actually sparked by the Sandy Hook massacre in 2012, he said uh, he hoped that the bill could be enacted by the end of the legislative session in July. Now, with heavy Democratic majorities in both the State House and State Senate and a Democratic governor, um, the chances for passage look reasonably good. In fact, maybe even more than reasonably. Uh, considered that the objection that was raised uh, by the House Assistant Minority Leader was, in some ways, that the bill isn't strong enough. For example, on imposing penalties on so-called straw sales, which is where someone buys a gun intending it to be used by another person. Meanwhile, uh, partway across the country, the city of Chicago has come out with its response to a federal court ruling that was in January that said that the city's outright ban on handgun sales in city limits went too far. The response the city has come up with is a sweeping ordinance loaded with strict regulations, including the requirement for videotaping all gun sales and special use zoning that would sharply limit the maximum possible number of gun shops in the city. All of which will come as horrible news to Sam Wurzelbacher, uh, a.k.a. Joe the Plumber, who actually was neither Joe nor a plumber, who apparently jealous that Sarah Palin is still soaking up all the why are we still paying any attention to this person vibes, uh, responded to all this by publishing an open letter to the parents of those shot and killed by Elliot Roger and particularly to Richard Martinez, telling him in just these words, back off. Because again in just these words, your dead kids don't trump my rights. There, frankly, is no pit deep enough to contain the bottom of a soul like that. So, as I said, uh, it's not really good news, but it's not altogether bad news either. And the fact is, some weeks, that's the best you can do. All right. To something else now that's been in the news, uh, hasn't gotten as much notice as the discussion about guns has, but still, it's important because they're still at it. They, in this case, being the people who think that taxpayer-funded, government-supplied services to the general public and to people like the poor and needy, that basically government services are themselves inherently evil and should be destroyed. They've now taken renewed aim at a perennial target. A target uh, it's a target for two reasons. One of them being is that it's very successful and very old. The United States Postal Service. Now, I'm sure you've heard, because if you heard anything about this, that uh, you've heard how the Postal Service is on the brink of financial collapse, of financial disaster, of crushing bankruptcy. It's on the, on the edge, the precipice of utter ruin and failure. 
You'll be forgiven for wondering if how it could be on this precipice for year after year after year and not actually fall over into it, but that doesn't matter to the uh, true believers in coming catastrophe. Most specifically, Representative Daryl Issa, who chairs the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee and who, on an almost regular basis, comes out with proposals to save the USPS by basically slashing away pieces of it. He has, for example, proposed eliminating Saturday delivery, closing post offices, uh, this is a good one, contracting out retail services of the Postal Service to places like uh, Staples, so that you would have some minimum wage clerk at Staples doing this instead of somebody at the post office and closing mail processing plants because that somehow was supposed to speed up delivery. And now he's managed to get through his committee, uh, the committee he chairs, a demand that the Postal Service end door delivery for 15 million postal customers in the next 10 years, forcing them instead to use banks of so-called cluster boxes at curbside. Now, opponents have said this is a lousy idea, partly because they point out in urban areas this generally is impossible because there's no place to put a cluster box, but Issa just responds that it will save money, according to his committee's calculations, about $2 billion a year. And let's, let's be honest, let's make no mistake, the Postal Service does have and has had financial troubles. For example, despite continuing cost cutting this year, a 2.3% rise in operating revenue this year, and increased employee productivity this year, the Postal Service still reported a $1.9 billion loss for the first three months of 2014. But here's the thing. The thing that's almost never mentioned in media accounts of this whole issue. Remember what I said uh, was that, uh, last week or the week before now about the media failing to inform us that, that we are by our media uninformed, malinformed, and misinformed? Here's another example. The Postal Service is in a truly weird situation. It is a quasi-governmental agency run independently but still subject to strict oversight and restrictions set down by Congress even though it receives not one single penny of public money. The Postal Service is entirely self-funded through the sale of postage and postal services. But even though the federal government provides not a penny to the Postal Service, it still has a huge say in how the Postal Service operates. One example of this is that it has banned the agency from raising the cost of postage beyond the inflation rate. Which means, in other words, in real dollars, the only way that the U.S. Postal Service could increase its income is by expanding its business, the very thing that all of these proposals to save the, UPS, uh, the USPS would prevent from happening by interfering with its ability to continue to provide the level of service it's already providing. More than that, in 2006, Congress passed the Federal Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, one of those remarkably and classically misnamed bits of legislation. That bill mandated that within 10 years, that is by 2016, the Postal Service fully fund retiree health benefits for future retirees out to 75 years in the future. That is, Congress was requiring of the Postal Service that within 10 years it have, eno have enough money set aside to fully fund health care benefits for retirees who had not even been born yet. That's a requirement of, a task taken on, a demand of, made by no other agent, agency, no other corporation, no other department, in or out of any level of government anywhere in the entire United States. It is completely unique. Well, there's a way to save money. Release the, uh, by the way, this, this, this demand, it's costing the Postal Service five and a half billion dollars a year to try to meet this demand. So here's a way to save money. Release them from this onerous and stupid demand. But oh no, according to Congress, we can't do that. What we have to do is cut services and fire workers. Which brings up the other, remember I said there were two reasons that the Postal Service was a perennial target. This is the other one. The United States Postal Service has a very strong union, which is also one of the largest unions in the United States, with a membership around 600,000. 
It is a union that has secured decent pay, decent benefits, and decent job protection for its members, which in case you've forgotten, is what a union is supposed to do. You're told to be jealous of the kind of benefits that a postal worker might have, the kind of pay that the postal worker might have. No, 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 no. No. The issue is not not why they have so much. The issue is why you have so little. I keep saying this over and over again. Remember to be angry at the right people. The fact is, the one thing that people like Daryl is a jerk uh, hate more than successful public services is successful public services with strong unions. So make no mistake, at the end of the day, what the attack on the Postal Service is about is about breaking the union. That's what it's about. And if these twerps have to take down the entire Postal Service in order to break the union, they will do it. We're going to take a break. And here we are back. Uh, I've got an update, just a sort of a sidebar update from something from, from a couple of weeks ago. It was t actually two weeks ago. I was talking about the decision by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court that the phrase under God in the Pledge of Allegiance actually has nothing to do with religion and therefore it did not in any way impact the religious freedom rights of atheists. I noted as part of the court's decision that part of its argument was that reciting the pledge is voluntary, that students are, quoting the court, free to recite the pledge or any part of it that they see fit, or in fact that they can, again quoting, choose to abstain. Which, as I noted at the time, is quite true legally, but I question just how true it is socially in actual practice. Well, we have our answer. The Elmira City School District of Elmira, New York, stands accused of bullying a high school sophomore who refused to stand for the pledge because she objected to the phrase, under God. She was ordered to stand by her teacher, who threatened her with disciplinary action if she refused, and also told her in front of the entire class that not standing for the pledge is disrespectful to America and to military personnel. And it seems this was not a, a, an isolated incident at the school. The American Humanist Association, in a letter to the school demanding that it recognize the students' constitutional rights to not say the pledge, said, and I'm quoting the letter, we have been informed that teachers and even an administrator in your school have inappropriately pressured students to participate in the pledge exercise. For example, students have been told that non-participation is, dis is disrespectful and unpatriotic, that non-participation would itself be disruptive, and that participation is expected because non-participation would encourage others to opt out. So even though the legal right to refuse to say the pledge is clearly and well and long established, the question about the practical ability, the day-to-day -day social ability to do that, that question remains. All right, so, you know, just speaking about things I like about the flag and the like, uh, last week during the show I missed uh, uh, saying anything about Memorial Day because, frankly, I'm old and I never got used to Memorial Day being a movable holiday and I still think of it as being on May 30th. Um, well, and I'm going to take advantage of that fact because May 30th is the traditional day and that is during this week. So I figure I can still use this now. First, I wanted to note that there is always, even though there is always at least just a touch of the honor and glory of war about Memorial Day celebrations, not everyone embraces that. For example, the Boston chapter of Veterans for Peace marked the day with a ceremony to remember both the dead and injured, the injured both physically and psychically from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and to call for an end to war. Uh, in fact, the Boston Globe quoted Pat Scanlon of the Smedley D. Butler Brigade of the Veterans for Peace as saying, quoting, Memorial Day is not a day to espouse militarism. Memorial Day is a day to remember. 
Uh, maybe that was why, uh, that attitude was why, in a day peppered across the country with parades, 21 gun salutes, patriotic praises, and praise of all things military, the observance of the veterans for peace uh, was what the Boston Globe called stunningly quiet, as I would think it should be. And one other thought on this. Back in May of 2002, someone on a mailing list I was on posted a message asking people to take a moment of silence on Memorial Day, saying, and I'm quoting them, let us ensure that those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom are not forgotten. In response, I wrote this, which is something I like to recall every Memorial Day. And in that silent moment, remember, too, the many nonviolent warriors who struggled, searched, sacrificed for justice and freedom, who remain without songs or memorials to celebrate their lives or their passing, but who at some moment stood weaponless against the machinery of oppression and showed in their simple no more a force that can move history. It's indicative of how we as a culture regard things that uh, we, on the whole, we celebrate our soldiers when they're still alive and our nonviolent warriors only when they're safely dead. But on the other hand, the truth is, I really don't think we are particularly unique in that respect. All right, we've got two things left to do, our weekly features. The first of our regular weekly features is the Clown Award, given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, trying to fill six vacancies on the federal court in Georgia, uh, Barack Obama made what was called an all-or-nothing deal with Georgia's Republican senators, uh, Saxby Chambliss and Johnny uh, Isaacson. And again, showing the remarkable negotiating skill for which he is so famous, the amazing Mr. O cut a deal wherein the conservatives got to pick four of these six nominees. One among those four is today's winner of the Big Red Nose. His name is Michael Boggs. Boggs has been a target of the righteous wrath of progressives and even some liberals based on his record as a state legislator in Georgia where he stood clearly against gay rights, civil rights, and the right to choose. Now, During his confirmation hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Boggs did his best to squirm away from his own record, claiming he regretted this vote or that vote and he was glad something he supported failed to pass, you know, and yada yada yada. It was a hard sell especially for me, when he said he meant no disrespect to African-American residents of Georgia with his vote in favor of keeping the Confederate symbol on the state flag and went on about how agonizing the vote was for him. If someone is accusing someone of being a racist, I don't know how you disprove that, he said. Well, not voting to keep the Confederate symbol on the state flag would be a good start. But he's not done yet. Oh, no, he's not done yet. As a legislator in 2001, he supported a measure that would have required doctors to publish online their profiles, including the addresses of their practices, along with a statement of how many abortions they had practiced that year. A bill that would essentially put a target on the back of any abortion provider in the state. What was Boggs' excuse for voting for this when he testified? Well, it came up as a floor amendment, he said, and he hadn't had time to talk to colleagues or study the issue. Now, first off, leave aside the fact that it seems to me that if you get faced with an amendment you don't know enough about, uh, what you do is not vote on it. But realize what he has just said. This guy is claiming that he was totally, blissfully unaware of the physical risks this bill prevented, presented to abortion providers. Putting on his best Sergeant Schultz face, he insisted he knew nothing about the shootings, the murder, murders of doctors, the clinic bombings, none of it. He simply had no idea. And if that wasn't enough, it turned out that he damn well did have an idea. An audio recording of the debate has emerged, uh, making clear that legislators, including Boggs, knew what the amendment would do and why it was so dangerous. A danger that had caused this very amendment to already have been rejected by the Georgia State Senate. 
What's more, it also develops that the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is the largest paper in Georgia, was at the time publishing articles about this and uh, about risks to abortion providers, including an editorial opposing the very sort of amendment about which Bog claims was such a surprise. There was just no way about it. Michael Boggs, Barack Obama's nominee for the federal district court in Georgia, is either a liar or a complete lame brain, and in either event, Michael Boggs is a clown. All right, our last thing, it's the outrage of the week, and this, I have to tell you, I came across this, I had something else completely in mind for the outrage of the week, but I came across this, I just found this so offensive that I don't even know if I could explain it. Okay, this appeared on a chalkboard at a place called Scruffy Buffy's. It's a, a Duffy's, rather. It's a bar in Plano, Texas. And if you can't make out what that says, it says, and I'm quoting, I like my beer like I like my violence. Domestic. And someone thought that was funny. To make it worse, if that's possible, when a woman named Courtney Williams, who was at the bar, complained to multiple managers about it, saying it was an extremely poor taste and she'd really like it taken down, she was told she was overly emotional, being too aggressive, and should just calm down. Apparently, she was just another hysterical female who was not to be taken seriously. Now, however, after she left, and apparently after somebody got the idea, eh, maybe that's not such a good thing to say, but now we don't have to be admit that it was because some woman made us do it. After she left, the sign was taken down. And after the bar got flack about it when the story got out, management responded with a statement blaming an unnamed female, and yes, they specified female, employee as having written something offensive without owner's approval. Apparently, the multiple managers to which William complained were not concerned about owner's approval either. And the worst of it is, the worst of this is, as always, as it so often happens, that what was worse than that was the comments in response to the article. With, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way. I have coined the term a malevolence of machos. With a malevolence of machos going on about how, by, by objecting to that, you're taking away our freedom. It was just a joke and blaming Williams for the whole issue. Every day, on average, in the United States today, every day, three women in the United States are murdered by an intimate male partner. A husband, an ex-husband, a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend. And despite the passage of the Violence Against Women Act in 1994, the U.S. still has the highest rate of domestic violence homicide in the entire industrialized world. So no, you dolts, the only freedom you lose is the freedom to be a complete rock brain jackass. And no, it was not just a joke. It was an outrage. That's it for this week. We're done. I'm out of time. So we're going to see you next week. In the meantime, you have the best week you possibly can. And as always, peace.